Chapter 4. Injustice is a great sin. Injustice draws the wrath of God. It is important for a man to have God's blessing. It is a great wealth. What God blesses will stand firm. It will not crumble. Whatever is not blessed will crumble. Injustice is a great sin. All sins have some extenuating circumstances, but injustice has none. Injustice draws the wrath of God. It is a tremendous thing. Those who commit injustice set their heads on fire. You see them do all kinds of injustices, and then their loved ones die, and they seem not to care at all. How can people who are so unjust prosper? They do the things they do, they give the devil rights over them, and for this reason they suffer so much. They get sick, and so on. And then they come to you and say, Pray that I get well. Most bad and harmful things happen when we wrong other people. For example, when a fortune is made unjustly, the owners may live a few years like royalty, but in the end, they will spend all their money on doctors. Remember the saying, quote, What is gathered by the wind is also scattered by the wind. Or remember what the psalm says, Better is a little that the righteous hath, than the abundance of many wicked. Psalm 37, verse 16. What they collect is spent, blown away. Rarely will an illness, a bankruptcy, and so on be sent as a trial from God. In such cases, one's reward will be great, and he will later become richer, as happened with Job. Some people are buried, and their bodies do not decompose. It's usually because they have done some kind of injustice. The unjust person is tormented. An unjust person, and in general all those who commit injustice and do not ask for forgiveness, end up haunted by their conscience and the indignation of those they have treated unjustly. For if the wronged do not forgive and complain, then the unjust are tormented and suffer very much. They cannot sleep. They feel like they are at the mercy of crashing waves that twist them around from every side. It's a mystery how the perpetrator is informed of this. When we love someone and think about him in a good way, he knows it. So too in this case, the victim's pain tears the unjust into pieces. It does not matter where he may be, in Australia or in Johannesburg, as long as the person he has treated unfairly is indignant with him he cannot find peace. And what happens if he is insensitive? Do you think that the insensitive people do not suffer? The best they can do is resort to some sort of entertainment to be distracted. Then again, those wronged may have forgiven the offender but still harbor some resentment. In this case, the victim suffers to a degree, but the wrongdoer suffers to an even greater extent from his victim's indig indignation. But if the perpetrator seeks forgiveness and his victim refuses to forgive him, then it's the victim that suffers. There's no greater fire than the inner burning of the soul by the conscience. Unless one repents in this life for the injustices he has committed and makes reparation, his soul will be tortured and eaten away by woodworm and in the eternal life by the sleepless worm. Even if he has no other way of showing repentance, the least he can do is have the right intent. I remember how this one lawyer, who committed many injustices, suffered at the end of his life. He practiced his profession in a province with many stock breeders. Naturally, their herds would damage the fields, and many shepherds would hire him because he would convince the justice of the peace or the agronomist with his cunning arguments. The poor farmers could rarely find justice for damage done to their crops, and they even found themselves in trouble. Everyone knew this lawyer, and no honest man went near him. I should tell you about the advice that a spiritual father gave a sensitive shepherd. The shepherd had a small herd and a sheepdog. The dog had given birth to puppies, and he gave them all away, except one that he kept for the mother. It happened that this ewe had gone missing, leaving behind its little lamb that was still suckling. 
With its mother missing, the little lamb would run after the dog to find nourishment, something that relieved it as well. Thus the two animals had gotten used to each other, and one would find the other. As hard as the poor shepherd tried to separate them, they would not part. Because the shepherd was a sensitive man, he thought of asking his spiritual father if the lamb's meat would be edible or not. Knowing how poor the shepherd was, the father thought for a while and then said to him, My son, this lamb is not edible because it fed on the dog's milk, but you know what you should do. Since all the other shepherds bring gifts of lambs and cheese to this certain lawyer, you should bring him this lamb to eat. He is the only one who has a blessing to eat it, since everyone knows what an unjust man he is. When this unjust lawyer reached old age, he became bedridden and suffered from nightmares for years and could not sleep. He also suffered a stroke and could not even speak. The father tried to make him at least to write down his sins, but he had lost control of himself. The spiritual father was thus forced to read him the blessing of the seven youths so that he could close his eyes and get some sleep. He would even read exorcisms to give him a little peace until finally the man passed away and was laid to rest. May God grant him the true rest. Yarunda, many people believe that they are under a magical spell. Is it really possible to put a spell on someone? If a person repents and goes to confession, such spells are not effective. For witchcraft to stick, a person must be guilty of some injustice, such as harming someone or fooling a girl. In this case, he must repent and ask for forgiveness, confess, settle things spiritually, and restore the wrong he's done. Otherwise, even if all the priests in the world would read an exorcism for him, the spell would still not go away. But even if no witchcraft is involved, the resentment borne by the soul he has treated unjustly is enough to torment him. There are two forms of injustice, material and moral. Material is when we harm another person with regard to material things. Moral injustice is when the wrong is of a moral nature, such as when a man deceives a woman, and if she happens to be an orphan, the burden on his soul is fivefold. Do you know that bullets will go after wrongdoers in war? There you can clearly see the justice and protection of God. There's no room for dishonor in war. A bullet will find its way to an immoral person. Once my company was on its way to replace a battalion. On the way we got hit and returned fire. I remember that one man from my company had actually committed a dishonorable act the day before. He had raped a pregnant woman. Poor woman. And guess what? He was the only one who got killed that day. Horrible, isn't it? Everybody was saying, ah, this beast, he deserved to die. In the end, the devious and cunning tried to escape one way or another, but they are not spared. We know from experience that those who truly believe and as a result live an honest Christian life have their honest bodies protected from enemy fire. It's like they carry a holy relic of the Holy Cross with them, and even more than that. One's descendants are also tormented by injustice. Yarunda, when I left to join the Holy Monastery, my family was unjust to me. Should I ask for what legally belongs to me? No, that's not the proper thing to do. I fear that something bad may happen to them as a result of this injustice. Now, this is what I call pure philotimo. If I were you, I would tell them, I want nothing for myself, but I would like you to give the share that is rightfully mine to the poor with your own hands, starting with our poor relatives. I am asking for this because I don't want the wrath of God to fall on your children. You see, sometimes a father may give away his fortune for the good of his soul, to create a charitable institution, for example, and leave nothing to his own child. 
the grandparents in a family may have done something wrong and still live a good life without consequences, but their children or grandchildren may suffer. They become sick and are forced to give the money their ancestors made unjustly to doctors to pay back the injustices of their grandparents. A family I once knew was going through many difficulties. The head of the family got very sick first, went through a lot, was bedridden for a few years, then passed away. Then his wife died, and later his children, one after the other. His filth, his fifth and last child passed away recently. Even though they were a very rich family, they lost everything and ended up poor because they had to sell their property to pay the doctors and the various expenses. I used to wonder why all these horrible things, sicknesses and accidents, were happening to them. I happened to know some of the members of the family, and it did not seem to me to be the good kind of trial, the kind that God sends to those he favors. Rather, it seemed to me that God's spiritual laws were put into effect. I wanted to be certain, so I, I tried to find out more about the family from reliable sources, namely some old folks who lived in the same town. I learned that the man had inherited a certain fortune from his father, which he increased by doing all sorts of wrong things. So if a widow, say, were to ask him for a loan to pay for her daughter's wedding and promise to return the money once she had harvested the crops, he would ask for a piece of land she owned. And as she was in great need, she would have to sell him the land at any price he offered. Another man would ask him for a loan to pay the bank and promise to repay him after having harvested the cotton. He would demand the poor fellow's land and would get it for nothing, as the farmer was afraid the bank would come after him. When someone else asked him for a small loan to pay the doctors, he would seek to take his cow from him for pennies. This is how he made his fortune. The pain he caused to all these poor people was returned not only to him and his wife, but also to his children. So the spiritual laws came into effect and caused them to suffer the very same things that their actions had caused to the others. In order to pay all their medical expenses and so on, they sold their land for nothing, and after becoming poor, they left this life for good, one after the other. God, of course, with his love and sense of justice, will judge them accordingly. The others who were harmed, all the poor folk, were forced to sell out their belongings to pay off the doctors. All these people will be rewarded for the injustices they endured. And, of course, the unjust will also pay their due. The one who wrongs us is our benefactor. Yet, under how should we consider someone who treats us in an unfair way? How should we consider him? We must treat him like a great benefactor who makes deposits on our behalf into God's saving bank. He's making us eternally wealthy. This is not a matter of minor importance. Are we not supposed to love our benefactors? Shouldn't we express our gratitude to them? In the same way, we must love and feel grateful to the person who has treated us unjustly because he benefits us eternally. The unjust receive eternal injury, whereas those who accept injustice with joy will be justified eternally. A pious family man had suffered many injustices in his work, but he was full of kindness and endured it all without complaining. He came to my cell once and told me all about it. Then he asked me, what do you advise me to do? What should you do, I said, is to expect the divine justice and the divine return and to be patient. Nothing is lost. In this way, you are putting money into God's savings bank. You will surely receive dividends in the next life for all the trials you are going through now. You should know that the good Lord rewards the unfairly treated person even in this life. And if he does not always reward him, he will surely do so with his children. God knows. He has providence for his creatures. Where there is patience, things fall into place. God provides. We need patience, not logic. Since God is watching, he is observing us, we must 
surrender unconditionally to him. You see, the righteous Yosef did not say a thing when his brothers sold him into slavery. He could have said, I am their brother, but he said nothing until God spoke and made him a king. Footnote Genesis 37 verse 20. But when one has no patience, he suffers. From that point on, he wants things to come his way as it suits him and as is comfortable for him. But of course, he does not find comfort that way, and things don't come out the way he wants them to come. When someone is wronged in this life, either by men or by demons, God does not worry because the soul benefits as a result. Many times, however, we say that we are wronged, while in reality, we are the ones causing the harm. We must be careful to distinguish the two. Render, therefore, to all their due. Romans 13, verse 7. Yet under when, when we purchase something for the monastery, some people don't want to issue us a receipt. What must we do? Well, they should always issue you an invoice, and you should limit your needs and demands. This is what I would do. God will provide for what you need. If we monks ask people not to issue invoices, we make others sin. They think to themselves, since the monasteries are doing it, when we, who are supposed to obey the commandments of God, operate in this fashion, what will people think? Won't they be scandalized? The Holy Scripture reads, Render therefore to all their due. Even when I send a letter with a person and not through the post office, I still put a stamp on it. Lay people may justify their actions, but if the monasteries act like them, there will be little honesty left and the gospel will be put aside. When we do not give from our, pos our own possessions, and if anyone would sue you and take thy cloak, let him have thy cloak as well. We are giving a negative sermon, a negative example that allows the secular people to find an excuse for their own faults. They are looking for a way to comfort their conscience. We must be careful because we will have no justifications for our actions on the Day of Judgment. Our goal should be primary to defend the spiritual principles and not only the material things. When for some reason they do not give you an invoice, you must consider this a spiritual loss. Yet and it happens sometimes that someone gives a small amount as a donation to the monastery and wants a receipt for a bigger amount in order to present it as a tax-deductible expense. What must we do in this case? You must tell them, we don't issue receipts for a bigger amount. If you don't agree, we will return your money, and you may find someone else who may accommodate you. Be careful not to catch this disease. Yet on the handyman asked us to fire him so that he would collect unemployment benefits while still working for us. Oh no, that is not right. Even a person with only a bit of conscience left in him would not do such a thing. It does not become a monastery to get involved in such matters. It is better that you pay the handyman a double wage, even if you are in financial difficulty, in order to discourage him from such behavior. It's that serious. Blessed deeds bring more blessings, while injustice brings disaster. You should be very careful with these matters. Avoid bargaining with the workmen either. This is why we have fires and other catastrophes in monasteries. An employee takes an oath to perform his job in an honest way. For us monastics, this oath is twice as demanding. The promise we make is spiritual, and if we break it, the sin for us is twice as bad. Be careful to strike a balance and create a different, higher standard. I detect a wound swelling. It will break and clear up. God will not give his grace in a wrong situation because the only one being helped in that case would be the devil. Be careful to put sincerity and honesty first. Otherwise, you will end up like a drunken man who cannot walk straight. Can anyone in that condition stand on his own two feet? God's wrath will come and will be put to the test. In the first phase, gold will be separated from brass. In the second phase, it will become clear how many carats of gold 
each one of us is worth. The world is full of lies. People now grow into liars. They have made up a new kind of conscience. I will not become a liar and turn into something I am not because society demands it. I'd rather tell the truth and suffer. One must be careful not to enter in the orbit of secularism. Of course, our financial system today is of little help. People are forced to declare a smaller income. Once, I scolded some income tax officials who happened to be believers. What are you doing? I asked them. You must make sure to keep some of the yeast intact. I know of too many things that go wrong. Someone comes to the revenue service and says, I have an income of one million drachmas. The official declares that the man has an income of three million drachmas. He assumes that he is revealing only a part of his income, as is common practice, and that this hike will make up the difference. If, however, he is dealing with a conscientious person, tripling his income in this manner will backfire. It will make the man cheat on his taxes the next year. In other words, instead of helping change the situation for the better, you're making things worse. But we don't know when they are telling us the truth, the income tax person said. When you start leading a spiritual life, you will know, I replied. Then you will be able to understand and discern the difference. God will inform you, and you will know. How the world has cheapened. People's malice has exceeded all bounds. They try to deceive one another, and they consider it to be an achievement. Our world has become so cheap. Everything they make these days is a fake. And imagine that today people make more money than their parents and grandparents who were poor and only made a little. The quality of most things is so cheap. One day, someone brought me some tomato plants. Each plant was inside a very small bag containing coarse soil and some coarse sand to keep the moisture. They didn't even bother to pour some water or manure. They had sprinkled some on the top like salt and pepper. When I took them out of the bag, I realized that their roots were rotten. I had to put a layer of soil on top so that the plants could grow new roots. They're so clever in tricking people. Listen to this. Someone had brought me a big box with pastries. I will open it, I said to myself, when I have a large company. If I open it now, it will attract ants. So one day I had a large gathering, and I figured the box should be enough and I should even have some left over. As soon as I opened it, I saw that it was full of wrappings, and the actual container with the sweets was so tiny. The rest of the box was empty. Another time they brought me a fancy box with pastries all wrapped in ribbons. I will keep it, I thought, for the students of the Athonius Academy. Well, inside they were Turkish delights, stale and hard as a rock. I would never treat people with this kind of sweet. Yananda, don't they see that this is a type of injustice? No. They consider it to be an achievement. Sin has become fashionable nowadays, and cheating someone is considered to be a sign of cleverness. Unfortunately, the secular spirit sharpens the mind in deception, and people consider it a clever achievement to wrong their fellow human beings. There's even an expression, He's as smart as a devil. He gets things done all right. Inside, of course, the man suffers from the checks of his conscience, his little hell. The just person has God on his side. Not all people fit well in the world today, especially those who want to lead spiritual and honest lives. They seem to have such a hard time. Yet under why don't they fit? When someone is sensitive and finds himself in a harsh environment and people make his life hell, how can he put up with it? Either he has to begin cursing or he must leave. But that's difficult because one needs to make a living. His boss tells him, I trust you because you don't steal, but put some rotten produce among the fresh. Take those fresh clover bales and stick some fermented ones in the package. He even makes him manager in order to keep him on the job, and the poor man has to do as told to stay employed. 
and of course he cannot sleep at night, and he starts taking sleeping pills. Do you know how hard life is for honest people? They, they run into all kinds of difficulties and have to take all kinds of abuse from their employers. Life becomes hell for them, and they cannot quit because they have a family to feed. If they stay on, it's trouble every day. They're between a rock and a hard place. Wherever they turn their eyes, they see a dead end. It makes one go crazy. So they carry on and try to manage as best they can. In another case, one employee did all the work while another colleague would only show up to collect his paycheck. I know someone who was department head somewhere. When the new government came to power, they removed him from the post and replaced him with a party member who had not even graduated from high school. They made him department head, but he knew nothing about the work, and so they could not really send the previous manager away to some other position. What did they do? They just added a second desk in the office. The old boss did the work, and the new one was just sitting there smoking, chatting, and drinking coffee, and being completely shameless. And in addition to this, he would say whatever came to his mind while all responsibility fell on the other employee who was doing all the work until he finally couldn't put up with the situation anymore. Left the job, the poor soul. Maybe I should go somewhere else. There's not enough space for two desks. He said one day and got up and left, because the new head was making his life hell. We are not talking about one or two days. It is unbearable to have someone like that over your head every day. The just person is usually given the worst position or may even lose his position to others. They abuse him and step all over him. Don't we have the saying, they walk over corpses, they stop at nothing. But the more people push the just and unrighteous per the righteous person down, the more the good God lifts him up like a cork. It's not easy though, and it takes a lot of patience. Patience clears up so many things. The person who wants to live a virtuous life and be honest in his work, be it a laborer, a merchant, or whatever else, must accept the fact that once he begins work, he may have to reach the point of not being able to even pay the rent, for example, if he has a store for the blessing of God to come to him. But he should not have this as his goal. Quote, if I should reach that point, then I will surely have plenty of customers. One must not think that way or aim at that, because then God will not bless him. But when he decides to live as God wills and resolves not to cheat or overprice things, God will not abandon him. Another person may gain much profit by overpricing. At first, he makes a lot of money. He becomes rich. But then people find out that he's dishonest, and his business goes stony broke. On the other hand, the honest merchant gains customers and hires more employees. So he is tested in the beginning, but wins in the end. The good person is tried and tested by evil and cunning people. He has to pass through the card. Footnote, the card. It's a wire tooth brush or machine fitted with rows of wire teeth used to disintegrate fibers as of wool prior to the spinning. To continue, when someone follows the devil's path and comes up with tricks and all kinds of deceptive schemes, God will not bless his work. Schemes of deception don't work. They appear to flourish, but they collapse in the end. It's important that we start with God's blessing in everything we do. A just man has God on his side, and if he, be, if he has some boldness before God, then miracles happen. When someone lives according to the gospel, he is entitled to divine help. He walks with Jesus Christ. What can we say? The man has earned his blessing. This is the foundation of it all. Once that is given, there is nothing to fear. The important thing is that Christ, Panagia, and the saints should find rest in everything we do. And when that happens, we will have their blessing and the Holy Spirit will overshadow us. Honesty is the most precious Holy Cross. If someone is dishonest, even if he has a piece of the honorable cross on him, it's like he has nothing. But if one is honest, he has God's help, even though he doesn't have a piece of the honorable cross. Now, if he has both, 
Well, then he's got everything. The just person is rewarded in this life. I've seen injured souls who have endured injustice with good thoughts and have been showered with God's grace in this life. Many years ago, a pious, simple, and good-natured Christian man came to see me. He asked me to pray so that Christ may enlighten his children when they grow up, to endure without grudges a great injustice done against them by their relatives. He told me the affair. As far as I could see, he was really a man of God. He was the oldest of five children. After the untimely death of his father, he stood by his younger siblings like a good father. He worked hard, increased the family fortune, bought more property, land, and so on, and helped the, his two sisters get married. His younger brothers got married too, and they took all the good fields, the olive groves, and so on, leaving him with a few useless, barren, and sandy fields. In the end, he got married too, and had three children. By that time, he was older and was worried about his children, that they may be bitter over the injustice when they would grow up. He used to say to me, I'm not concerned about it for myself, because I read the Psalter. I do one reading in the afternoon and two before dawn. I almost know it by heart. You don't read anywhere in the Psalms that the unjust prosper. God looks after the just. You see, Father, I am not sad for the land I lost, but for my brothers who are losing their souls. He went away at that time and visited me again some ten years later. He was very happy. Hey, remember me, Father? He asked. Remember me? Of course, I replied and asked how he's doing. I'm wealthy now, he said, and how did you get rich, my good brother? I asked him. Well, all that useless sandy land of mine appreciated greatly because of its location on the beach. This time I have to come ask your advice about how I should spend my money. Well, you should make sure your children have a home to stay and put aside enough money for their education. I have enough for that, he said, and more. Well, then give some of some of the money to your poor relatives and to other poor people that you know. I have done so, Father, he said, but it's, it's still a lot. Then you should give some to repair the church in your village and the chapels in the countryside. I've done that too, he said, and I still have plenty. Then I told him, I pray that Christ guides you to do good to those who really need it. I asked him about his brothers. He started weeping. I don't know, Father. I've lost track of them. They sold their land in the village, the olive groves in the fields, and I have no idea where they are now. They had gone to Germany first, then to Australia, and that's the last I've heard of them. I was sorry I had asked about his brothers. I hadn't realized how sad he would get. I tried to console him. He left in peace. I told him that we should both pray to get good news from them. Later, I remembered the psalm. I have seen a wicked man overbearing and towering like a cedar of Lebanon. Again I passed by, and lo, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Psalm 37, verses 35 to 36. That's exactly what happened to this man's brothers. There's nothing worse than the injustice. Make sure you have God's blessing in whatever you do. Chapter 5. Bless and do not curse. Someone asked me, isn't the hymn we chant during the Great Lent, Bring more evils upon them, O Lord. Bring more evils upon those who are glorious upon the earth. Footnote Isaiah 26.15 isn't that a curse? And if it is, why do we still chant it? When the barbarians are attacking, I replied, and are ready to destroy a people just like that, and the people are praying that their enemies encounter obstacles, that their chariots break down, their horses get harmed. Is that good or bad? That's what it means. 
that they may run into obstacles. It's not a curse. Yet on the, when will the curse stick? The curses stick when injustice is involved. If someone, for example, deceives a grieved person or does them harm and that person curses them, then the whole family can be adversely affected. In other words, when I harm someone and that person curses me, the curse will stick. God allows the curse to take effect as he may. For example, allow a person to kill someone. But when there is no injustice involved, when the curse returns to the person who gave it. And how is one released from a curse? With repentance and confession. I know of many cases of people who suffered from curses. And when they realized that they had been cursed because they had wronged someone, they repented, went to confession, and everything was fine after that. If the wrongdoer says, My God, I have done such and such a sin, forgive me and confesses with pain and honesty, God will forgive him. He is God, after all. Does punishment come only to the person who has been cursed, or does it also come to the one who cursed him? The cursed person suffers in this life, but the one who curses suffers in this life and in the next one. For unless he repents and goes to confession, God will treat him like a criminal. Of course, someone who has hurt you, has caused you pain. But to put a curse on him is like taking a gun and shooting him. Who gives you the right to do that? No matter what the other person has done to you, you don't have the right to kill him. Those who curse have malice in their heart, and the curse sticks when it's spoken with passion and indignation. Now, when a curse comes from a just person, it becomes very powerful, especially when it comes from someone like a widow. I remember an old lady who had a small horse, which she, she used to leave at the end of the forest to graze. Well, because the horse was a bit wild, she was using a strong rope to tie it. Once, three women went to the forest to cut wood. One of them was rich, the other one was a widow, and the third was a very poor orphan. They saw the grazing horse tied with the rope and thought to themselves, Why don't we take the rope to tie our bundles of wood? So they cut it in three pieces, and each of them got a piece to tie their bundle. The horse, cut loose of course, ran away. When the old woman came back and did not find it, she became very upset. She started looking for it everywhere and went through a lot of trouble to find it. When the old woman finally found it, she said with indignation, May the person who stole the rope be tied by it. One day, the brother of the wealthy woman was fooling around with a gun. He wrongly thought was empty. It was left behind by the Italians after the war. And the bullet hit his sister in the neck. They had to take her to the hospital and they, they needed a rope to tie her on a wooden ladder they used as a stretcher. But they found the stolen rope, but it was not long enough. The other two neighbors brought the pieces of the rope they had stolen, tied her on the ladder, and carried her to the hospital. This way, the old woman's curse came true. Let them be tied by it. She has since died. May God rest her soul. You see how her curse stuck to the rich woman who had no financial need. The others were very poor, and for this reason, their offense was less grave. Illnesses and accidents caused by curses. There are illnesses that doctors cannot figure out, and some may be the result of curses. You don't expect doctors to diagnose the curse, do you? Once they brought to my cell a paralytic. He was a full-grown man, and he could not even sit up. His body was rigid, like wood. One person was carrying him on his back, another was holding him from behind. I put two logs for the poor soul to lean on. His escorts told me, He's been like that since he was fifteen years old, and it has been eighteen years since then. And how did it happen, just like that? I wondered to myself. That can't be. Uh, something must be going on. I looked into the matter and found out that someone had cursed him. Let me tell you what happened. 
Some time ago, he was on a city bus going to school and, he, and was sitting in a seat, all stretched out. At some point, an old priest and a little old man boarded the bus and were standing right next to him. Then someone asked the young man to offer his seat. He stretched out even more, ignored the suggestion. The little old man then turned to him and said, May you stay stretched like that and never be able to sit up. And the curse stuck. You see, the young man was shameless. He thought to himself, Why should I give up my seat since I paid for it? Right, but the other person also paid, and he's old and venerable man, and he is standing while you, a boy of fifteen, are sitting down comfortably. That's the reason this happened to you, I told him. Try to repent, and you will be well. You need to repent. When he figured out what was wrong, the poor soul repented and became well. Many of the horrible things that happen to people today are caused by curses, by indignation. And when an entirely an entire family is wiped out, or many of its members die, you should know that it is from injustice, or from witchcraft, or from a curse someone has put on them. A father had a son who was constantly going out. Once the father became furious and told him, May you come back once and for all. That night, when the son was coming home right outside the door, a car struck him, killing him on the spot. His friends took his body and brought him home. His father came to see me and myself. My child, he said in tears, was killed right outside my door. Eventually he told me I had said something to him. What did you tell him? I asked. I was so mad because he was out every night that I told him, may you come back once and for all. Do you think that's what what caused it? Well, what else could it be? I answered. Repent and go to confession. You see, he told his son, this time come once and for all. And the boy came back dead. And now the father is writhing with pain and shedding all these tears. The curse of parents can be very effective. Keep this in mind, when parents curse their children, the curse sticks. Even their ind indignation can harm. Even when there is no curse involved, only indignation, the child will not see a good day in his life. He will be miserable. It will be a horrible life, even though in the next life he will have less of a burden, given the price he paid here. What happens is what we read in Abba Isaac. He eats away his own Gehenna. Footnote, the sayings from Isaac the Syrian's ascetical homilies, homily number 32, to continue. In other words, his sufferings in hell will be reduced by the sufferings he has endured in this life. When the spiritual laws are put into effect, a portion of what we might suffer in hell is removed. Parents who, when enraged with their children, will send them to the out of here, the Greek expression meant to refer to the devil without mentioning his name. Actually promise them to the devil, who then acquires rights over them. Well, you've made a vow to me, the devil tells them. Once there was a couple in Farasa who had a baby that used to cry a lot, and the father used to send him to the, the out of here all the time. Again, the original Greek expression referring to get out of here towards the devil without using the name of the devil. He used to say it all the time, and this is what happened. God allowed that what, whenever the father said the curse, the child would disappear from the crib. The poor mother used to go to Hagia Phenitis and cry out, Hagia Phenitis, bless me, the demons have taken my child. So he used to go and pray over the crib and the baby would come back. This went on continuously. Once the poor woman told him, Haji, Efenenti, how long will this go on? 
I am not tired of coming back at all. I am not tired of coming back all the time, he was telling her. Are you tired of going back and forth to call on me? In time, the devil will get tired and let your baby go. From that time on, the child did not disappear anymore. Later on, when the baby grew up, he was given this nickname, the devil's example. He was able to stir up the entire village, leaving nothing unturned. My poor father had such a hard time with him. The father, the elders, it was referring to the village mayor. The elder's uh, father was the village mayor. At footnote, the capital village of six Greek villages in Caesarea section of Cappadocia, in the hometown of St. Arsenios, the Cappadocian, and of Elder Paisios, Farasa. And this is how the residents of Farasa used to call St. Arsenios of Cappadocia after his pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Haji Ephenitis is a compound word from Haji, pilgrim, and Ephintis, meaning a person with authority. So the, ref, the, the, the example was from St. Arsenios of Cappadocia. To continue, he used to go to one person and say, so-and-so said this about you. Then he used to go somewhere else and say the same thing. So-and-so said this about you. As a result, people were getting into fights. When they figured out that he was the cause of it all, they went looking for him in order to lynch him. But he managed to get his way with them, and in the end he would even have them apologize. He was such a devil, an exemplary devil. God arranged things in such a way that the other villagers realized what had happened and came to their senses. They started showing restraint and became really, really careful. We don't know how God will judge this poor man, but that's another subject. He surely has some things in his favor. There is no greater fortune in the world than the blessing of one's parents. The same holds true in monastic life. The greatest blessing is the blessing of your Yeronda, your spiritual father. That's why we have this saying, you should have your parents' blessing. I remember a mother who had four children and she was crying because none of them had gotten married. I will die and still have this pain in my heart. Please say a prayer for them, she would say to me. She was a widow, and her children were orphans, and I took pity on them. So I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. But nothing happened. I then thought that something was going wrong. Someone has put a spell on us, her children would say. No, it's not a spell, I told them. It doesn't seem to be a spell. This is something else. Did your mother ever curse you? Yes, father, they replied. When we were little kids, we were very mischievous, and we always got in trouble, and our mother used to tell us day and night, You'll end up like stumps. You'll end up like stumps. I told them, Go talk to your mother. Shake her up. Tell her to repent. Go to Holy Confession, and from now on to give you her blessing all the time. In less than two years, all of them got married. The poor mother was a widow and apparently petty at heart. Having to raise four rowdy kids, she was often losing her temper and was starting to curse them. What if the parents curse their children and then die? How can they get rid of such a curse? Well, if they take a hard look at themselves, they will realize that the reason their parents cursed them was because they were acting like fools and gave them too much trouble. So if they realize their mistake and truly repent and go to confession, they'll be fine. And if they advance in the spiritual life, they'll be even able to help their parents. Yarana, when I left home to come to the monastery, my, my parents actually cursed me. Well, these are the only curses that turn into blessings. The so-called polite curse. Yananda, when someone wrongs us, is it right to think or say, may he find his punishment from God? Whoever says this is being tricked by the devil and does not realize that this is a polite way of cursing the person. There are some people who like to see themselves as sensitive, loving and refined and tolerant of the wrongs they suffer. Yet they still say, may he find his punishment in God, from God. 
in this life, we are all taking the test to enter the eternal life, to enter paradise. My mind tells me that this kind of polite curse is below the passing grade and is not right for a Christian because Christ did not teach us this kind of love. He taught us to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Likewise, the best blessing is to remain quiet while being cursed and accept with kindness the curses leveled against us. If we suffer slander and injustice in the hands of frivolous or cunning people who are full of malice and distort the truth, we should try, if we can, not to defend ourselves against them, especially if the injustice is about ourselves only. Neither should we say, may they find their punishment from God, because this is a curse too. The best thing is to forgive them with all our heart and to ask God to give us the strength to bear the burden of a slander, while continuing our spiritual life quietly and undetected as much as we can. Let those who have it as their habit to judge and condemn others continue to wrong us because in this way they are preparing golden laurels for us in the true life. Naturally, all those who are close to God never curse because there's no malice in them. They have only goodness and gentleness and the bad things people throw upon these holy souls are sanctified and they feel a great hidden joy. The evil eye. When jealousy is malicious, it may cause a lot of harm. That's what the evil eye is all about. It's a demonic force. Yet, does the church recognize the evil eye? Yes, there is even a special prayer for it. Footnote, Elder Paisios emphasized that only priests can read the prayer for the evil eye. The evil eye works when a person speaks with envy and malice. Many people yet to ask for evil eye pendants to protect their babies. Should babies have such things on them? No, they should not. You should tell mothers that the only thing needed is a holy cross. Yaranda, if someone praises a nice piece of work and those who created it accept the praise with pride and then some harm happens, is that the work of the evil eye? No, that's not the evil eye. In this case, the spiritual laws are simply at work. God removes his grace from man and some harm happens. The evil eye is rare. Only those who have both envy and evil intentions, and they are not many, have the power of the evil eye. Let us say a woman sees a cute little child with its mother and thinks to herself with bitterness, Oh, why isn't this child mine? Why did God give it to her? She can actually bring harm to the child, causing it to lose sleep, to cry all the time and suffer, all on account of her malicious thoughts. And if the child got really sick and died, she would be pleased. In a similar way, someone else may see a calf he wants to possess, and in a short while, the animal dies. Many times, however, a child may suffer, and the mother herself may be to blame for this. Maybe the mother saw a skinny little child once and said, Hey, look at this. This child is all skin and bones. All along, she might have been thinking about how great her own child was while looking down on the other. And now that she has said with malice about the other child has happened to her own child. And the child suffers without having done anything on account of the mother's fault. It is withering away so that the mother may be punished and realize her mistake. This child will die a martyr. The judgments of God are unfathomable. A blessing from the heart is divine. Now let me give you a curse, in quotes, too. May God flood your heart with his kindness and his abundant love until you go out of your mind. May your mind leave this earth, even while you are in this life, and stay close to him. May you go mad with the divine madness of God's love. May God burn your hearts with his love. Don't ask me for a second curse. This good curse of mine works because it comes straight from my heart. I had felt so sorry for you when I was at the sanatorium in 1966. Some of you had been waiting for eight years. We will build a monastery. 
you were saying time and time again, but no monastery would be built. You had lost hope. Then I thought to myself, as soon as I get out of the hospital, the monastery will grow like a mushroom. And that's what happened. In a year's time, the holy monastery was ready. And it was because what I said, I said it with my heart. And you also had good intention and God did not abandon you. Nothing else can explain what happened. When you feel pain in your heart for a person who is humble and asks you from his heart to pray, for example, for some passion that torments him and you tell him, don't be afraid, you'll get better. The blessing you give is divine. It's full of love and pain and that's why it works. It pleases God and he makes the blessing come true. You see, even the pain we feel for someone is a kind of blessing. Once, when I was in the army, the commander sent me to deliver an offering to a small chapel of St. John the Prodromus because the saint had helped us during the war. I was to buy two candelabra for the chapel and at the same time to escort someone who was going to be tried in a military court in Napatos. The others told the commander, you found the right person to deliver him. The poor soul was from Epirus, a musician of sorts, an impoverished man, married with children who had been accused of wounding himself to avoid going to war. I suppose he thought to himself, I'd rather be with one leg than get killed. We went together down to Agrinio, where he knew some people. Hey, let's go and see him told me and I replied let's go let's go here let's go there he would say and I followed what could I do it was quite tiresome and he did not want me to turn him in I really felt pity for him and at some point I said don't worry you'll see you'll do better than all the others the commander will write a letter and they'll probably put you in some office and you'll take care of your family and save your life too well, when the family reached, finally reached Nakhpaktos, we found out that indeed the commander had sent a letter and the man had been exonerated. Otherwise, he would have been brought before the firing squad. Things are very strict during wartime. The commander took pity on him and he was hired as a cook in the transit center. He even brought his family to be with him and they lived better than all the others. There was plenty of leftover food because the soldiers did not always go there to eat. So he got, got to feed his children. Everybody later would tell him, you've had it better than everyone else. You see, the rest of us were up in the mountains in the snow. The blessing I gave him found favor with God because I said it, feeling the man's pain in my heart. And that's why God acted on it. I remember another case in Konitsa when I was at the Holy Stomian Monastery dedicated to the Nativity of the Theotokos. After the Feast of the Panagia on September 8th, the pilgrims had left the place very untidy. As I was fixing something, I see that my sister and another girl had stayed behind, cleaning up. The poor girl had two sisters. She was the youngest who had married while she remained single. She had so much philotimo. They stayed and cleared up everything. And at the end, she said to me, Father, if you need us for anything else, we'll stay. So much philotimo, I thought to myself. Therefore, I go to the little chapel and I say with all my heart, My sweet Panagia, take care of her. I don't have anything to give her. And even if I did, she would not accept it. Well, as soon as she went back home, a young man was waiting for her a fellow I knew because we were together in the army, a really nice person, a piece of gold, and from a good family. They got married, and everything turned out so well. See how Panagia rewarded her? Chapter 6 Sin Brings Calamities Did you spray uh, pesticides for the caterpillar? I did, Yanana. All these nuns, and you cannot even get rid of one caterpillar. During the German occupation, when a plague of locusts had fallen, the holy belt of Panagia from the Vatopedi Monastery was brought here to Halkidiki for protection. And I remember how 
cloud after cloud of locusts were falling into the sea. We all worked together to gather them and tarpaulins and put them away. It was a time of hunger. I don't want to even think about it. Wheat started growing again that year, but the crop was destroyed. Locusts, wars, drought, and disease. They are all scourges. They're not God's way of educating human beings, but the result of our moving away from God. They happen because we stray from Him. God's wrath comes to make us remember Him and ask for help. It's not that He arranges and orders, so to speak, these calamities to happen. Rather, God allows them to happen because He sees how far human evil can go and how unwilling we are to change our ways. And so He tries to bring us to our senses. But they are not of his own making. God had told Joshua that the Israelites should not exterminate the tribe of the Philistines because the Philistines would be a scourge to them every time they would forget God. So when the Hebrews drew apart from God, the devil acquired rights, and he had as his cousins the Philistines to attack them. They would take the children of the Hebrews and smash them on rocks to kill them. Once, when the Israelites were attacked without being at fault, God took their side and fought for them. He sent hail the size of stones and destroyed them because at that time the Israelites had a right to divine intervention. God had made so many promises about the Temple of Solomon to the Israelites, and yet look how many times it was burned and ravaged. When the people of Israel strayed from God, the prophets would cry and cry for repentance. But the Israelites would hear nothing of it. They had put their minds to rest, thinking that since God blessed the temple when Solomon built it and said that from now on our own people will be blessed and holy, it's clear that everything, our walls and our temple, will stay in place as he promised. Well, God did make this promise, but only on the condition that the Israelites would live righteously. His grace was in the temple, but the Israelites broke the commandments. He allowed for it to be burned down and destroyed. When they repented, they were able to rebuild again. For example, during the reign of King Zedekiah, when the people again strayed from God, Nebuchadnezzar came along and set the temple on fire destroyed the city walls and took many of the leading people prisoners in chains to Babylon. Of course, along with those who were at fault, there were many who were innocent, so it was to their benefit. The guilty paid for their sins. Those who were not entirely to blame suffered, but they also reaped a small reward. Now it's a crime when the suffering of the wrath of God by so many innocents is caused by the actions of only one person. And the reason is that the innocent would have inherited the kingdom of heaven without going through all this pain. Instead, they are now tormented. It is good to know that the faithful who obey the commandments of God receive his grace, and that God is, shall we say, obliged to help them in their these difficult times. I have heard that a new disease, footnote, this was said in November of 1984. St. Paisos is referring to AIDS. To continue, <clears throat> I have heard that a new disease has appeared in the United States. Many people who live unnatural, sinful lives are infected by it and die. Now I've been told that the disease has also spread here. You see, it's not God who destroys people. It is people who destroy their families and themselves. It's easy to see that those destroyed are people whose lives have lost all meaning. Yet, on the, why haven't we found a cure for cancer yet? Is it that God does not allow it, or that we don't ask for his help? Well, the bad news is that even if a cure were to be found, a new illness would appear. When tuberculosis was around, they found the cure. Now... It's a new disease, cancer. And if God were to help cure cancer, another disease would follow. Human beings will once again be the cause. And that's the way it will continue, without an end in sight. 
Whatever God allows is out of love for man. You know, why does God allow a calamity to happen? There are all kinds of reasons. Sometimes God will allow something to happen so that something better may come out of it. And other times he wants to educate us. Some people are rewarded and others pay a debt. Nothing is wasted. You know, whatever God allows, even when human beings perish, it is done out of love for man because God has a heart. Do you remember how the prophet Elijah slaughtered the 300 priests of Baal? He told them, go ahead and pray and I will do the same. And the altar fire that starts up by itself will show us whose God is the true God. They started shouting, hear us, our God Baal, hear us. And the prophet told them, your God is indisposed and can't hear you. Shout louder. So they went on screaming and slashing their bodies with knives, as was their custom, and being in excruciating pain. They were screaming even louder to get Baal to listen to them. Since nothing happened, the prophet Elijah finally told them, pour water three times over these logs. So they did it once, twice, three times. The wood had become very wet and water was pouring all around the altar. As soon as the prophet Elijah prayed, fire fell from the sky and everything they had brought for sacrifice on the altar was burned. And so was the altar itself. The prophet then said, arrest these priests because they deceive the people and mislead them into idolatry and they were all slaughtered many may wonder but how could the prophet have slaughtered so many people god is not a barbarian and neither was the prophet but these idolatrous priests had misguided so many people that the prophet came to the point of saying i am all alone so much was their influence and the truth is that they suffered more from slashing themselves than they did from the knife of the prophet Elijah that put an end to their suffering. The pain they caused on themselves was greater because, as you can see, what God allows is for the love of man, whereas their feats were so cruel and painful. Yet under why was God's punishment so Im immediate in the Old Testament? At that time, that was the only language and the only law that people could understand. God was not any different then because that law was designed for that particular people. Do not consider the law as being cruel in the gospel as something different. The law was necessary, the Torah, to benefit the people of that time. Keep in mind that it was not the law that was cruel and barbaric, it was the people. Today people might do worse things, but at least they understand how horrific they are. Nowadays, a mere oil lamps, a mere oil lamp starts swinging. He's footnote. Yet, I'm just referring to the oil lamp that may move miraculously, such as the oil lamp in the Cathedral of Iveron Monastery in Monathos, which occasionally, as a sign of impending events on the Holy Mountain or elsewhere in the world, will start miraculously swinging. To continue. Nowadays, a mere oil lamp starts swinging, people are shaken up. But you see, in those days, God had to do so much. He had to send ten plagues to the Pharaoh in order to take the Israelites out of Egypt. He turned the Red Sea into dry land so that they could walk to the other side. He provided a cloud by day to protect them from the sun and a pillar of light to guide them by night. And even after all these miracles, they took a golden calf for their God. Today, people would never believe that a calf could lead them to the promised land. Today, God is put aside. The good God gives us his blessings in abundance. We should not be ungrateful and rouse his anger because the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 5, 6. God forbid. In our days, people have not seen war and hunger and they say that they have no need of God. They have everything and appreciate nothing. But if hard times come, such as a famine and so on, and they have nothing to eat, be sure that they will come to value even bread. 
and marmalade and everything else they will be deprived of. If we don't praise God, he will allow us to be tried with some misfortune so that we may come to appreciate the good things that we have. But if we are full of appreciation, God will not allow anything bad to happen to us. In the old days when we did not have the great comforts we have today and science had not advanced as much, people were forced to take refuge in God to cope with their difficulties and God would help them. Nowadays, because science has made such great advances, people put God aside. They live without God. They figure, we'll do this, we'll do that. They think of fire engines, of drilling equipment, of this and that. But what can they really do without God? They will only bring about His wrath. You see, for example, when there's no rain, instead of saying, we'll pray, they say, will drill for water. And the worst part is that it's not only the unbelievers who think this way, but with all the technology in our hands, even the faithful are forgetting God's power. We are fortunate that God has not given up on us. But little do we understand of his wonderful providence and care for us. Some folks were saying, we don't need God, we have drilling equipment. In fact, we should be asking and pleading with God even more for a double miracle to take place because we have damaged nature so much with all our doings. I was watching the clouds the other day. They were going back and forth, gathering here and then spreading over there, moving up and down. Then the wind blew and took them away altogether. And instead of people saying, now God must perform two miracles, to keep the clouds in place, what we actually hear is, we don't need God. We must be grateful that he does not take seriously every word we say, otherwise we will be in such trouble. The drill 150 meters into the ground to find water, they did, and they found nothing. In Napoleon, they went 180 meters deep and found only salt water. Others want to divert the Elenos River and bring it into Athens. They've been trying to do this for 10 years and nothing has come of it. Can you imagine the expenses involved? And even if they had succeeded, the city would still run out of water. But most people would never come out and say, I have sinned. During the recent drought, a politician went to a small village and promised to provide water by purifying and reusing the wastewater. And they were so impressed. This makes no sense. See what people are coming up with? We're going to start drinking, forgive my saying, our urine. To consider this in a city where people have been overwhelmed by the secular spirit and things are out of control. I guess it makes some sense. But to consider this to be a solution in a tiny village and to think of it as being progress, it's really incredible. Here people should turn to God and ask for his mercy, to send them some rain, instead of trying to solve their problem by purifying their urine. It's a horrible thing. Up on the holy mountain of Athos, some monks tried to plant pine trees in order to use them later to make paper. Well, they all dried out. That was God's answer. Now tell me, is this what the holy mountain should be producing? Napkins and toilet paper? Do you see what's happening? Nothing came out of their labors to plant these trees except the wrath of God. Yet on the, did they realize that what they were doing was wrong? Of course they did not. They even brought machines from Germany to drill for water. And instead of finding water, they lost even the water they already had. Do you see what happens when spiritual sensitivity disappears? and is replaced by the business instinct. This is why monasticism itself is gradually losing so much of its piety. They do not seem to understand that without the rain, even the existing water will disappear. They use only logic and put God aside. We read in the Old Testament that during a Syrian siege, Samaria had run out of water. It was a horrible long-term siege Animals were dying left and right, and mothers had reached the point where they were eating their children. The prophet Elisha went to the steward of 
King Jehoram and told him the animals may be dead and people dying of hunger, but God's help is on the way. The steward who sought to solve everything through his logic replied, Where will the help come from? The sky? Then the prophet said, God will send help tomorrow, but you will not be there to rejoice in it. And that's what happened. The next day God sent such a panic to the enemy camp, causing them to hear galloping horses, the noises of chariots, their ears buzzing, that they thought that the Egyptian reinforcements had arrived. So they went on the run and left behind their tents, food, and weapons, and all their possessions. And when they went back to their homeland, temptation brought them such confusion that they ended up killing each other. 180,000 people gone. Meanwhile, four Israelite lepers that were living outside the city said, Why don't we go to the enemy camp to see if there's something to eat? We are dying anyway. They approached one tent and found it empty. They looked into another and it was empty as well. The enemy was nowhere to be found. So they took food and whatever else they could find, sacks full of things. They let the others know that the enemy had retreated, but the Israelites thought it was all a plot. The enemy is hiding, they thought, to make us open the gates and let them in. An officer then told them, we are left with five animals. Why not send a few soldiers to see what's going on? Each soldier went into a different direction, and when they returned, they reported, The enemy has left panic-stricken, leaving everything behind. Then all the Israelites came out of the fortress to get food and so on. On their way out, the starving crowds ran over the steward, who was standing there, trying to maintain the order. And that's exactly what the prophet Elisha had said, that the steward would witness God's help but not enjoy it himself. You see how God put everything in order? May God have mercy on the world and send us some rain. God has set everything in order. The snow melt and the spring fill with water. Now there is no snow and no rain. This was said during the great drought of November of 1990. What is going to happen? What will people drink? May God have mercy on the people. May he have compassion for us and send us some rain. Because if this drought continues, the leaves of the trees will dry out and there will not be any green olives or even green leaves. No matter what man may sow, unless God pours his blessing from above his rain, nothing will come out. Rain is agismos, blessed water. You see, People have gotten used to living with plenty of water, and they will have such a hard time, poor souls, with water sh shortages. It is not only because of our sins that God will not send rain, but also because it will not suffice for everybody if we use so much of it. I am thinking what will happen in the cities. They need a bucket of water just to flush a toilet. Without water, germs will be everywhere, and then cholera will follow people will die, and their unburied bodies will need to be sprayed with disinfectant. Fortunately, the good God is still providing for the world. We live in the times of the apocalypse. The drought we have been having for so many years, the lack of rain, what do you think they're all about? Was there such a drought before? Even here in Halkidiki, an entire river dried out. The fish died, and there was a stench everywhere. In Thessaloniki, too, they have problems. The water level at Marathon Lake is so low that one can see little isles here and there. The level of the Penisios River is also down. The Evros River has some water, but the Bulgarians dammed it to the north, and now it has dried out. If there is trouble with Turkey, tanks can now easily go through. The same thing is going on in Cyprus. If it does not rain this year, they'll have a major problem with water. And that's not all. There's so much more. As for the trees, 
Some are burned by forest fires, while others dry out and die altogether. People also get sick and die. When people do not repent, how can God send us rain? If we put our trust in God, do you know what can happen? It is not a small thing to have God on our side. For God, there are no difficult problems and no difficult solutions. To God, everything is simple. He does not use greater power for the supernatural things and less power for the natural things. He uses the same power for everything. The most important thing for man is to cling to God. Do you pray for rain? Or aren't you concerned? This is the time for plowing the fields and sowing the crops. The fields should have been sown by now, but people cannot even plow them yet. This drought is a trial from God. The monk's work at such circumstances is to pray. And I have a complaint against you. Last time when people were harvesting the wheat to make hay because it had not rained, you did not even bother to say a prayer for them. And we all know why. It was because you, you had water for yourselves and were watering with a hose. This should not be repeated. Next time you should experience the other people's pain and learn to pray for them. You should write to me and let me know. You will take exams. If you pass, that is, if it rains, I will make you my partners in prayer and will share whatever we receive from divine providence. When I pray for rain and I see even one cloud in the sky, even if it does not send some rain, I praise God for sending even that one little cloud. But my conscience bothers me because there are so many spiritual clouds inside me that displace God's clouds. If we humbly ask God for his mercy, he will help. In a time of drought, a humble man's prayer will gather clouds. And we should always pray that the rain God sends may also have a spiritual energy to quench the spiritual fire which the evil devil has set in the world to burn souls. I was pleased when I heard some people say, we aren't worthy because God has taken pity on us and he sent us some rain and some snow. If we have such humble thoughts, God will send even more. To recognize our sin in the beginning is the beginning of repentance. Thank God that a bit of yeast still exists. Pray that God take his screwdriver and tighten up the screws in people's minds. I see good intentions in some people in high places. At least they understand where we are heading. May God grant repentance. Oh, if we could only understand the great forbearance of God. It took 100 years to make Noah's ark. Do you think that God could not have made an ark any faster? He let Noah suffer for 100 years so that others may understand and repent. Noah would tell them, Repent, a deluge is coming. But they would only mock him. He's making cages, they were saying, and went about their usual business. And now, in two minutes' time, God can shake up the world and change all the people into believers, super-believers. How? All he has to do is turn the earthquake button from 5, 6, or to 7 on the Richter scale. At 8 on the Richter scale, the high-rise apartment buildings will be falling upon each other like drunkards on the street. At 10, everyone will start screaming, We have sinned! Please save us. They may even say, We will all become monastics. But as soon as the earthquake is over, while still shaking but standing, they will again run to the buzuki clubs, the long stringed instrument, like related to the mandolin. Their return to God would not be from true repentance, but they would just say it temporarily to be saved from the disaster. Yet you know, when an act of God occurs, and it is a manifestation of his wrath, will the prayers of just people be heard? Do you know what actually happens? The prayers of the righteous cannot be heard because people have not really repented. It is a different matter when we anger God through sin and, and actually recognize our fault. Then he takes pity on us and comes to our assistance. 
But when we don't recognize that we've angered God and go on in our usual ways, then how can God hear the prayers of the just? Have we made a mistake? Then we must realize that we have done so, if God is to forgive us. In the case of spiritual people, mistakes are not excusable. One of the prayers says, for our sins and for the people's acts of ignorance. The prayer from the Proscomity in the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. To continue, for, you see, for lay people, mistakes are, quote, acts of ignorance. But for those who live spiritual lives, they are sins. That is why when a spiritual person makes a mistake, it is a serious offense. Lay people have excuses. This year's fire on the Holy Mountain during the Feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos on August 15th it was something horrible. This was said in November 1990. Every possible expert was on site, but they could do nothing save stand there and watch the fire spread. Even the airplanes dropping water seemed to be making things worse. In one monastery, they even created fire safety zones to protect it from the fire, but the fire suddenly jumped over to the Arkandariki, the guest house. The holy mountain was burning for 15 days. On the 15th day, the fire burnt out by itself. Some people were saying, why doesn't Panagia put it out? We come to the point of blaspheming the name of God. After six days, another fire started somewhere else, but rain came and put it out directly. Don't they understand? How is it that this fire burnt out, but the other fire did not? There are those who pray with the pain in their heart, but not knowing the spiritual laws are not heard because the wrath of God is already in effect. Others, again, don't pray at all. They do not even do one komboskini because they agree with God's righteous wrath, whose purpose is to make people come to their senses. May God enlighten us monks more, because most of us are foolish virgins, and our lamps are filled with water, and there isn't enough oil for the wick. People who live in the world are expecting us to lighten the way, to keep them from stumbling. Let us pray that God will grant us repentance, so that we may escape his righteous wrath. This wrath will come and the only way to confront it will be to repent and obey his holy commandments. Part 2. Modern Civilization Quote, Civilization is a good thing, but if it is to be beneficial, the soul must also be civilized. Chapter 1. God's Wisdom and the Environment In wisdom hast thou made them all. Yet, on the, is it right for us to destroy the swallow nests? The swallows, they leave their droppings, which soil the area and attract bedbugs. Well, can you create a swallow nest? Look at what God has created with just one word. What harmony, what variety. Wherever one turns, one sees the wisdom and the grandeur of God. Look at the celestial lights, the stars. With what simplicity his divine hand has scattered them in the sky, without using a plumb line and a level. They give such comfort to people, whereas man-made lights tire the eyes even though they are placed in regular distances. You see, trees planted by man in a forest resemble an army battalion, whereas natural forests made of trees of different colors and sizes comfort the human eye. Natural forests are so peaceful and restful. Some trees are small and others are big, and each one has its own color. One of God's small wildflowers has more grace than a pile of fake paper flowers. They differ as much as nylon differs from eilon. It's a pun, and eilon in Greek means immaterial. Everything that God has made is a wonder in itself. Human body, for example, resembles a factory. God has arranged everything, the heart, the liver, the lungs, and so on, with great wisdom. Think of the wisdom which plants are made. During the German occupation, we used to plant about five irrigated acres of melons. Once, 
I cut off the big leaves that ni lie near the roots, thinking that it would be good to clean them out. But those big leaves underneath serve like filters. They are the plant's kidneys and absorb the plant's bitterness. When the melons ripened, the bitterness was so bad that our tongue was stinging for hours. Yet on the, you notice everything. Yes, I find God in animals, in plants, in everything. How can you not admire it all? You see a tiny bird traveling to Africa and returning to find its old nest without the use of a compass. And people, even when using maps and signs, get lost. And it is not as if the birds walk on earth and mark the routes where they pass from. They fly in the sky high above the sea and cannot possibly mark these areas. Some small birds climb on the storks, the aeroplanes, to travel by aeroplane to their destination. During their journey over the sea, they stop occasionally on the islands they find on the way to rest. Once, when I was at the, the cell of Timios Stavros of the, of the Holy Cross, I saw a flock of birds coming from the east that looked like sparrows, but were bigger and prettier than sparrows. Four or five birds from the flock seemed to have gotten tired and could not fly anymore. At that point, about fifteen more birds broke from the flock to join the tired ones, and they rested on a tree, while the rest of the flock continued to fly. They rested a bit and then took off together. They climbed very high to get their bearings and to find their flock again. What impressed me was that the four or five tired birds were not left alone, but another fifteen of them broke off from the flock to keep them company. Everything God created is beautiful. Have you seen how beautiful and yet varied are the colors of kittens' coats? Wherever you turn your head, you will encounter God's wisdom. In the old days, everything was natural and beautiful. You see, when the rooster crows, it's not because it is telling the weather. It just sits on one leg, and when that gets numb, it crows, cockatoo, but it knows how many hours have lapsed. It switches legs, and when the one it is standing on gets numb, it crows again. And you know, it does that at fixed intervals, at 12, at 3, and at 6 in the morning, every 3 hours. It doesn't even have a clock or a battery, and it certainly does not need winding. Anything that you see or hear in this world, you should use it to reach up to heaven. Let it transport you there. Climb up step by step from the creatures all the way to the Creator. The Americans went to the moon, and at least they placed a sign up there that says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The Russians, they went too, but Gagarin, Yuri Gagarin, Soviet cosmonaut, first man to be successfully launched into the Earth orbit in 1961, said that he did not find God. How could he possibly find him, since he went with his feet upward and not with his hands raised up? That's how some people end up saying nature created the universe. The entire universe? Now, an old machine breaks down and a whole group of technicians and workmen gather to repair it. They put their heads together and they try again and again and again. And it's only an old machine. But God moves the entire globe without electricity, and the battery never runs down, and the engine never quits. And the earth turns with such a speed that man does not even notice. Isn't that amazing? If the earth were turning slower, man would be tumbling all over the place. Can you imagine that the sea contains so much water and moves with such great a speed without spilling it? Do you realize that the stars, with their huge mass, move with rapid speeds and yet do not touch one another and always keep the same distance? And here comes man and makes an airplane and glows with pride. And if he goes a bit mad, he starts making no sense and has no idea what he's saying. Our Modern Achievements Civilization is a good thing, but in order to be beneficial, the soul must also be civilized. Otherwise, we are in for a total disaster. 
Sen Cosmas, Sen Cosmas at the Los of Philotheu, lived from 1714 to 1779, his feast days on August 24th. Sen Cosmas said, Evil will come from those who are educated. This prophecy of Saint Cosmas refers to educated people who do not have fear of God. Despite the fact that science has advanced so much and made tremendous progress, when it tries to help people, it often ends up harming them, unintentionally. God allows man to do whatever he wants, but when we don't listen to him, we end up in disaster. The very things we create destroy us. What have we achieved in this century with our civilization? We've driven people mad and have polluted the atmosphere and the environment. When the wheel leaves its axis, it spins aimlessly out of control. Similarly, when people stray from God's harmony, they are tormented. In the past, people suffered from wars. Today, they suffer from civilization. Then war made them leave the cities and go to the villages where they lived off a small field. Now they will abandon the cities on account of civilization because they can no longer live in them. In the past, wars brought about death. Now it is civilization that brings about diseases. Yananda, why has the death rate from cancer gone up so much? It's the result of what they did at Chernobyl. Footnote, a city of the Ukraine site of a major nuclear power plant accident on the 16th of April, 1986. This is all man-made. We live in such a crippled world. Can you think of a time when so many people were sick? It was not like that in the old days. Now all the letters I get in the mail are about cancer, or mental disease, or strokes, or broken homes. This is what I hear every day. In the past, cancer was rare. You see, back then people led a natural life. God, of course, allowed illness, but that's another matter. People ate natural foods and were full of health. Fruits, onions, tomatoes, and so on. They were all pure. Now even natural foods make people sick because everything around us is contaminated. If things were this way back then, my eating habits would have killed me since being a monk I ate only leeks, lettuce, onions, and cabbage from my garden, and yet I lived on that diet for years, and I was so healthy. Now they use fertilizers and pesticides. Think of all the diseases brought on by food and stress. When science is used indiscriminately, thousands of lives are ruined. Yeronda, in the past, why did people bear asceticism better and were much healthier than they are today? Did the foods they ate also help? Yes, because back then food was pure. This is beyond question. Then they used to eat everything ripened. Now they cut everything before it ripens so that it does not spoil and they keep it in refrigerators. The fruit is gathered while still green and left to ripen. In the old days, fruit would get ripe while on the tree and then it would either fall from it or drop in your palm the moment you touched it. But besides eating good quality, healthy foods, bread and butter and milk were very nutritious foods for children because people would also use their mind and could tell if they got sick because of something they ate. Today our food is adulterated and on top of that people will not put their mind to work. And look at how many of the things that we make today are useless. We have gradually done away with wool. It's difficult to find a wool, woolen sweater to absorb your sweat. I put on a woolen undershirt and I can tell right away if it has synthetic material in it because my body cannot breathe. I experience discomfort and I feel like I am about to suffocate. And they consider synthetic fabrics better, sturdier. They consider it progress. But are these things really healthy? If you consider the way they make them, they're actually quite unhealthy, and the labels will still say pure virgin wool, and they will find even purer words to advertise these products. So now we, we raise sheep only for their meat, since we make wool from petroleum. And so the silkworm comes to us and says, 
If you want better silk, go ahead, make it yourselves. Yaranda, why don't we have patience today? The current situation does not help people to become patient. In the past, life was peaceful and people were peaceful and had the endurance to be patient. Today, haste has invaded the world and people have become impatient. In the old days, people knew they could eat tomatoes by the end of June, for example, and they were not concerned about it. They would wait until August to eat a watermelon. They knew in what season they would eat melons or figs. But today they'll import tomatoes from Egypt earlier rather than eat oranges which contain the same vitamins. You may tell someone, come on, why don't you wait and find something else to eat now? But no, he'd rather go to Egypt and get tomatoes. When people in Crete realized that, they started constructing hothouses in order to grow tomatoes faster. Now they constructed hothouses everywhere in order to have tomatoes available in the winter. They will work themselves to death to build greenhouses to grow all kinds of food and make them available throughout the year so that people will not have to wait. And let's say that this is not that bad, but they go even further. The tomatoes are green in the evening. In the morning, they have turned into plum red tomatoes. I scolded an officer of state once regarding this matter. Having greenhouses is one thing, I said, but using hormones to ripen the fruits, tomatoes, and so on overnight is going too far because people who are hormone sensitive will be harmed. They have destroyed the animals too. Chickens, cattle, they're all affected. They use hormones to make 40-day-old animal appear like it is six months old. Can anyone who eats this meat benefit from it? They give hormones to cows and they produce more milk than the farmers can distribute to market. As a result, the prices fall and producers go on strike. They pour the milk on the streets and in the meantime, we drink milk with hormones. Whereas if we left everything the way God made it, all would go well and people would have pure milk to drink. Notice how hormones make everything tasteless. Tasteless people, tasteless things, everything's tasteless. Even life itself has no taste. Nowadays, young people lost their zest for life. You ask them, what will give you peace? Nothing, they reply. Such vigorous young men and nothing pleases them. What has happened to us? We believe that we will correct God with our inventions. We turn night into day so that the hens will lay eggs. And have you seen these eggs? If God has made the moon shine like the sun, people would have gone mad. God created the night so that we may take some rest and look at us. We have lost our peace of mind. The hothouses, the use of hormones in produce and in animals have made people impatient. In the old days, we knew that we could reach a certain place on foot in a certain amount of time. Those with stronger legs would get there a bit sooner. Later, we invented carriages, then cars, airplanes, and so on. We try constantly to discover faster and faster means of transportation. There is an airplane which covers the distance between France and America in three hours. Footnote, the elders referring to the long-range supersonic passenger Concorde that flies faster than the speed of sound. But when someone goes from one climate to the other with such great speed, it's not good. Even the sudden change of time itself can be confusing. Hurry, hurry! Gradually, man will enter a projectile and will... With the squeeze of a trigger, this projectile will be launched only to burst open at some point and allow a madman to emerge. Where is all this taking us? We are heading straight to the madhouse. They have poisoned the air, but it is the bones of the dead that bother them? Yananda, they are thinking of starting to burn the dead for sanitation purposes and for saving space. For sanitation purposes? Listen to that. Aren't they ashamed to even say that? They have polluted the entire atmosphere and they worry about the bones of the dead? After all, the bones are clean. And what is this idea of saving space? There's the entire country of Greece. 
with all these forests and they cannot find some free space? I reprimanded a university professor about this one day. How come they can find space for garbage but not for bones that are sacred after all? Isn't there any free space anywhere? And do they realize how many bones of saints may be among them? They don't even think of this. In Europe, they burn the dead, not because of lack of space, but because they consider it progressive. They will not open a forest, but they will burn the dead to make space. They turn the dead into ashes and place them in a tiny box for more convenience, and they consider this progress. This way, the nihilists get their way, which is to eliminate religious and moral principles, everything, human beings included. They don't want anything to remind people of their parents, their grandparents, or the life of their ancestors. They want people to be divorced from their own tradition. They want to make them forget the future life and to tie them down to this one. But they say, I don't know, that there's a real problem in some municipalities in Athens. They have no space to bury the dead. There is so much space. How come they cannot spare some? There are so many public grounds outside Athens. I know many powerful people who alone own large areas of land out there. Can't they convert them into a cemetery? And by the way, most people come from the provinces. Why don't they take them back to their place of birth? They should bury each person in the place of their birth. And except for the transportation cost, the rest of the expenses will be lower too. They must issue an order that anyone who has come to Athens recently from the provinces is to be buried in their place of origin. And this is better. Now, for those who have been in Athens for three generations, they should find a way of burying them there. And later, when they exhume the bones, they can dig deeper graves and place the bones there. Is that difficult? People can dig so deep into the earth to extract coal. Let them make the effort to prepare some large area to gather all the bones. There's no respect left. And you can see what is happening now. Old parents are being put away in retirement homes. In the old days, they used to even take care even of their aged oxen. They would not slaughter them because they, they thought we have eaten bread through them, as the saying goes. In the past, there was such respect for the dead. I remember the risks we took to bury the dead during the war. Not only the priest, who was obliged to go anyway, took risks, but also the soldiers who had to carry the dead through the snow, in freezing cold, under enemy fire. In 1945, during the war, before I joined the army, I used to transport the dead with the church sexton. The priest went ahead with the censer and we followed. When we heard a bullet fly by, we would fall to the ground. It was difficult to get up after that, and when we heard another bullet again, we would fall to the ground. Later, while still serving during the war, we did not have boots and had to go barefoot in the snow, and they ordered us to go and remove the, sh the shoes of some soldiers who had died. Not one of us moved, but those good years are gone now. The problem is that those in power who could protest are not doing so because they support cremation. As for the church, since this problem has come up, it must take a position and resolve it. Otherwise, we will leave the charge of spiritual things to lay people, and whatever they say will become the rule. This is impiety. How can people have God's blessing under these circumstances? They are trying to gradually degrade human beings, but it will not happen that way they want. Somehow ample space will be found. You'll see. It will. Pollution and Destruction of the Environment The sun is hot in the Sinai Desert, even in winter, because they have open holes in the atmosphere. Without the northerly breeze, it's impossible to stand under the sun for long. Yet under what's going to happen with the ozone... We must show a little bit of patience until the scientists go up there with five kilos of putty and plug the hole up. Yes, let them go up to plug the holes, and they will realize that God has made everything to be good, to be in perfect harmony, and perhaps then they will say to the Lord, 
Have mercy on us, we did not do things right. Let's pray that the hole which has been opened in the atmosphere will be closed. Indeed, a bowl full of the wrath of God is now open in the sky and is causing trees and plants to wilt and dry up. See the book of the Revelation, chapter 15, verse 7. But God could do away with this problem. And now look at how cunning some people are. In order to get money out of the very wealthy, they spread the rumor that a hole has opened in the atmosphere and that the world will vanish. The only way to save the world is for scientists to dig deep into the earth and avoid the sun. Of course, this cannot happen. And so they change their story and make another claim that facilities will be built on the moon, restaurants, hotels, housing, and people will go there. And they're even taking down payments to secure a spot. The whole thing is a lie. There's nothing up on the moon. Human beings cannot live there. Only one or two persons went up there in a capsule and came back. And there are some people who believe this nonsense and pay money for it. Yet and many people worry about air pollution. This is why they must put pressure on factory owners to place anti-pollution devices and save people from all the smog. Instead of bribing members of parliament to take care of their interests, they should pay a little more money to install anti-pollution equipment in their factories. In the old days, there was no smog, no contamination like we have today. Today, everything is polluted, and people take that to be progress. How could this ever be considered progress when they are destroying human beings? You go out of your house and the air smells of fumes. As soon as you open the window, the smog comes in and sticks on your skin. Even when you wash your hands, you cannot get rid of it because it is not something pure. Smoke from the fireplace is exhaled by our lungs when we cough, but smog will not be exhaled because it contains oils and gets stuck there. In apartment buildings, people are piled up one on top of the other. When one dusts their clothes, the dust falls on the balcony below. I take pity on those who live on the first floor. They get all the dust and garbage of their upstairs neighbors. They have their clothes hanging out to dry on their window, happens to be open, and people throw their dusting from the floor above with no consideration for those below. In the old days, these modern apartment buildings would have been taken for prisons, like Yendi Kool, it's a Turkish name of a historical prison in the walls of Thessaloniki. It's just so dreadful. Years ago, our houses used to have a yard, animals, a garden, and a few trees where birds would gather. Nowadays, Yaranda, if you live in the city, it's rare even to see a swallow. Are the swallows crazy to go and live there? Gradually, people will forget what a swallow looks like. In America, at the theology department of a university that specializes in the history of the Old and New Testament, in order to make students understand what wheat is, they cultivate some of it on their grounds. And in order to make students understand what a shepherd and you are, they, they brought a small flock of sheep with a shepherd holding a shepherd's rod. And they call this a university. The air has been polluted. Even in the winter, we can smell the stench of garbage. Imagine how bad it gets in the summer. And they won't spe send an airplane to spray with disinfectant. We are lucky that God has made flowers with fragrant aromas. All these flowers, with their various forms and sizes, remove the stench with their fragrance. If we did not have that in the atmosphere, what would happen? It only takes one dead animal and the stench is unbearable. God takes such good care of us. What would we do if he ever abandoned us? With all these natural perfumes around, our own human stench goes unnoticed, and besides flowers give us so much delight. Once a layperson came to my cell and asked me, What are you doing here day and night all the time? Everything around me was in full bloom, a slope full of flowers. There was a sweet fragrance everywhere. So I said to him, Do you know what I must go through to water and take care of all these things you see? And do you see how many vigil lamps I light in the sky every night? I do not have enough time to light them all. 
He was looking at me dumbfounded. Don't you see all the lamps up there at night? I am the one who lights them. How could I possibly have enough time? It's not easy with so many lamps to change the wick, to pour the oil. Yet I'm just referring to the stars. The poor soul was at a loss for words. Spraying disinfectants is poisonous, too. On top of everything else, it also kills the poor birds. They spray the trees to protect them from disease, but as a result, people end up getting sick. Thus, everything is poisoned. Wouldn't it be better if we sprayed less and buried the rotten fruit in the landfills, instead of producing excessive amounts and throwing the good ones away? The vapors from the spraying are naturally harmful to man and can prove fatal for young children. This is one reason why they are born sick. I once said to someone, What's going on? You have killed the insects and now you're killing people. They spray the flowers to kill the insects and people get sick. Next thing you know, they will make even stronger pesticides. And what will come of it? It has been proven that some of the insects they exterminated were actually killing other harmful insects. Now we try to develop these insects again so that they can kill the others. God has arranged everything so well. Wherever there are crickets, there are no mosquitoes. A person came to the cell with a small device that produced a harsher version of the cricket sound to repel mosquitoes. They have killed the crickets, which, after all, made a sweet sound, and now they're trying to imitate their sound, which God has made, with a battery-run device. They have killed everything, the crickets, the turtle doves, it's rare to even see a raven today. Soon we'll be exhibiting ravens in a bird cage. When you spray the trees, let God help you a little. If the pesticides don't go everywhere, it doesn't matter. We have all kinds of means today for so many things, but nothing to strengthen our faith. I hear people ask, have they come up with a medicine for this? Where is it? Maybe abroad? And they rush to the phone to find out how to get it. Gradually, lay people and even monastics are putting God aside. You see, if spiritual progress came first, if that was our priority, everything would be made holy and good. The problem is that those of us in monastic life are not far ahead from lay people when it comes to spiritual progress. But Yeranda, Dacus is, is harmful to the olive trees, an insect. Well, pray with the Komboskini for the Dacus to leave the trees. Do not just rely on spraying. Try praying. Put some Christ in your work. We are making an effort to do things right as if we lived in the world. And it does not even cross our minds that we who live the monastic life must be concerned with the other world. We should not try to comp compete with those who live in the world. Where is Christ? What have we done with him? I am not saying that you should not spray at all, but just keep in mind that others are still experimenting, testing chemicals, and so on. And when you must spray, you should always wear masks. It is better to have some fruit affected by dacus than to try and spray everything in sight. Try and cut down on the number of sprayings. Instead of spraying everything, try to pray with devotion. Read the first psalm. Footnote, St. Arsenios the Cappadocian used to read the first psalm when the people of Pharasa planted trees in order for the trees to bear fruit. Read the first psalm and sprinkle some holy water on the trees. When you live correctly, you will get the rain you need. And the caterpillars will die. God will provide for you. You need to have devotion and trust in God. Chapter 2. In the Era of Comforts, There is So Much Discomfort. Footnote. In this chapter, we observe the militant spirit which the elder has as an ascetic monk, as well as his agony not to see this ascetic spirit of monasticism changed and altered by technology and modern advances. He was not against civilization. He wanted to stress that we must rule civilization and not be ruled by it. He used to say that especially the monk must control modern conveniences and use them with discretion in order to be able to channel his powers toward the spiritual combat. 
to return to the text. Even hearts have turned into steel. Because modern conveniences have exceeded all bounds, they have become inconveniences. Machines have multiplied and so have distractions. Man has turned into a machine. All kinds of machines and inventions now rule over man. This is why human hearts too are turning into steel. All of these modern comforts make the cultivation of the conscience in people difficult. In the old days, people used to work with animals and were more compassionate. If you overloaded an animal and the poor thing kneeled down from the weight, you felt bad for it. If it was hungry and looked at you sniveling, it broke your heart. I remember when a cow of ours fell ill, we suffered with it because we considered it a member of the family. Today people own lots of devices made of steel, but unfortunately even their own heart have turned into steel. Is the equipment broke? It is welded together. Is the car not running? It is taken to the repair shop. If it cannot be fixed, then throw it away. They have no feelings for it. After all, it's just a piece of iron. The heart does not take part in these decisions, and this is how selfishness and pride find fertile ground and take root. Today we have so little consideration for our fellow human beings. In the old days, if there was any leftover food, people would find someone that needed it and would give it away before it spoiled. A spiritually advanced person would even say, let the poor person eat first and I will eat later. Nowadays, people put the food in the refrigerator and don't even think of those in need. I remember whenever we had a good yield of vegetables or fruit, we would always share it with our neighbors. What could we do with all that produce? It would spoil anyway. Now that we have refrigerators, people think to themselves, why share it with others? We'll put it in the fridge and keep it for ourselves. And I will not even mention the tons of produce we throw away or bury in landfills while millions of people in other parts of the world are starving to death. We are mad about technology. Modern devices are endless. They run faster than the mind of man, because the devil has a part in it too. In the old days when we did not have telephones, faxes, and all kinds of gadgets, we lived tranquil and simple lives. Back then, yet the people would enjoy their lives. Yes, they did, unlike today when all these gadgets are driving them crazy. All these conveniences make people suffer and suffocate with anxiety. I remember how cheerful people were when I was at the Sinai Desert. I remember years ago when I was at the Monastery of Sinai. From this footnote, the years 1962 to 1964. What a cheerful people the Bedouin were. They lived a simple life in a tent. They could not live in Alexandria or Cairo. They found comfort in the desert inside their tents. They drank some tea, if they had any, and praised God. But now, with the advent of civilization, they too have started to forget God. You see, they've caught the European spirit. First, the Israelites constructed huts for them, and then they sold them all the old cars of Israel. Footnote, Sinai Peninsula that now belongs to Egypt, but then it belonged to Israel. Ah, those enterprising Israelites... Each Bedouin now has a hut, a broken car parked outside, and lots of anxiety. The car breaks down, and they go through all kinds of trouble to fix it. What do you think they gain out of all this? Nothing more than a headache. At least in the old days, things were well built and lasted a long time. Now you pay all this money to buy something, and pretty soon it breaks down. So the factories keep making new things and taking people's money. People are working so hard trying to make ends meet. Machines are the brainchild of the European scientists who spend their time with screwdrivers. Let's say at first they make a lid. Then they improve it by making it a screw-on lid. After that, they may add a push-button opening device to the lid to improve it even more. Each time, they try to improve it more and more. In other words, they invent new and better machines. And before the poor people have paid off the last model, they try to buy the latest and best. They end up tired and in debt. Today, even a poor man will sell whatever he has, oxen, horses, in order to buy a cheap car. And pretty soon, the way things are going, we will have to go to the zoo to even see a donkey. 
And so finally he buys a car. But then the car breaks down. There's no parts for it. And so they say, and he is soon forced to buy another one. He cannot afford the most expensive, so he buys one that is better than what he had before, putting the old one aside. We must be very careful not to fall into this channel ourselves and try to keep up with the newest fashions. Television has done great damage. Yet under nowadays, telecommunications are so advanced that one can see live what is happening at the other side of the earth. Yes, they see the entire world, but they don't see themselves. That is the only thing they do not see. Today, it's the human mind, not God, that destroys people. Yet under this television, very harmful. Of, of course it is. Someone came and told me, television is good, Father. Eggs are good, too, I replied. But if you mix them with chicken droppings, they become useless. The exact same thing happens with radio and television. Today, if you turn on the radio to listen to the news, you must put up with listening to a song before you can hear the news. In the old days, it was different. You knew the time the news would come on and that when you turned the radio on. Now you're forced to listen to the song as well. Otherwise, if you turn the radio off, you will miss the news. Television has done us great damage. It's especially destructive for children. A seven-year-old child came to my cell once. I saw the demon of television speaking through the child's mouth, exactly as demons speak through the mouth of the possessed. It was like a baby born with teeth. It is not easy to find normal kids. They are turning into little monsters. And you see, they don't get to think for themselves. They only repeat what they've heard and seen on television. That's why they come up with television to begin with, to make people numb and dumb, so that they will take what they hear and see on television for a fact and act accordingly. You know, the mothers are asking us, how can they keep their children away from television? They must help them understand that television dulls their children's minds. They lose the ability to think on their own, to think critically, not to mention the damage it causes to their eyesight. And we are talking about man-made television. But there is another kind, a spiritual television. When people uproot their old self and the eyes of the soul are cleansed, they can see into the future without the aid of any machines. Have they told their children about this other kind of television? If they won't, these boxes will make our children dumb. Adam and Eve had the gift of foresight, but they lost it when they fell from grace. If the grace of the holy baptism is preserved, children will get with, with it spiritual foresight. But this requires watchfulness, vigilance, and spiritual work. Today, so many mothers, having lost their spiritual bearings, preoccupy themselves with worthless and frivolous things, and then they come and ask me, What am I to do, Father? I am losing my child. 